hello everyone welcome back to our youtube channel let us see in this today's webinar a demo on biodap with biodap dashboard and swim community here this is a 3d swim community which is i'm scrolling now where we can post all our documents or images related to the project and three results you can see in these are the results related to this particular project and you can preview that particular item with the help of 3D Play. 3D Experience is a cloud-based platform where you can collaborate, integrate, simulate and store data as well as you can retrieve from anywhere on any device with the help of internet connectivity. 3D Experience with SOLIDWORKS collaboration, why is it necessary? It is necessary because industry leading with 3D CAD softwares like SOLIDWORKS has easy to use secure cloud data management. There is a securely we can store our data in a cloud which will be available with the 3D experience cloud based system. Collaboration with the team members, customers and suppliers so that we can collaborate and, and that means we can interact with the, our team members, project mates as well as customers regarding the project issues or any related uh, things with respect to the projects. Data mobility. Utilize your data on laptop, mobile, phone or tablet. That means you have access to utilize 3D experience wherever you go. Biodap is a company that designs, manufactures and distributes high performance lower limb prosthetic components used for action sports and other similar activities. The goal is to manufacture the highest quality and high versatile components that allow amputee to participate in sports and activities. This equipment can be used by many elite adapt adaptive athletes at the highest level of competition. Today we are going to focus on three topics that is part modeling and documentation, assembly modeling and validations, interoperability between SOLIDWORKS and 3D experience platform. Dashboards are a fully customizable view of the 3D experience platform. Think of this as your project homepage. We see just a few of the many tools available where you can store, manage, share, view, and mark up your designs in a secure cloud environment from anywhere, at any time, and on any device with a web browser and internet connection. On the left is a social collaboration tool where you can share information in real time just as you would on any social platform. We also have access to some commonly used models that we're currently working with and a viewer to visualize and annotate documents and 3D models. This post in the community indicates that we are seeing excessive deflection and we should redesign the lower bracket to incorporate the pin. Near the top, we need to validate the range of motion when the screw is in the inner resistance range position. Let's get started. We need to do some work on the Moto knee assembly. One way to access your models in SOLIDWORKS Connected is to simply drag and drop from our web browser into SOLIDWORKS Connected and the files will be downloaded and opened. It's just that easy. Now we were asked to create a new lower bracket to incorporate the pivot pin for the shock. Let's get some rough dimensions to start with. The old bracket is 25 by 65 by 40 millimeters, so that'll give us a good start. First we'll delete the lower bracket, the pin, and the screws to get those out of the way, and now our shock is free to float around. Let's start from scratch and create a new part for our assembly. We'll start by creating a sketch on the front plane, then sketch a rectangle. We want this to be 25 by 65 millimeters, and there's our first shape. Very simple, just a rectangle. Next we want to turn this sketch into a solid by using the extrude tool. Using the drag handle, I can change the depth or extrude in either direction. For this feature, let's snap it to 40 millimeters on the ruler and define this as a mid-plane extrusion. Let's round off some of these corners, and for that, we'll use the fillet tool. Selecting a single edge presents the selection manager, which helps predict logical sets of edges that would be appropriate for the selection. 
we'll choose the four parallel edges and accept the 10 millimeter fillet radius. On the front face, we need to add some mounting holes, and for these, we'll use the hole wizard. The hole wizard provides access to a variety of hole types, counterbore, countersink, standard holes, tapped holes, and a variety of slots. Choose your hole standard, the type of hole to create, and then your size. For these holes, we want an M8 clearance hole with near and far side countersinks of 14 millimeters diameter. Next, we need to position the holes, and this is done by just placing points on the front face of the model. Now, these two points are just placed, but free to move around. So let's start by adding a relation to position them horizontally to each other. Next, we'll add locating dimensions. The left hole will be 10 millimeters from the left edge of the model and 12.5 millimeters from the bottom edge. And finally, we can add a dimension to locate the two holes 45 millimeters from each other. We're presented with a preview of what the holes will look like and we can accept that. To locate and hold the shock, we're gonna use a shoulder screw. So we need to add a loop shaped feature at the top. Again, create a sketch on the front plane and start by drawing a vertical line, transition directly into a tangent arc, and then another vertical line down. We want this endpoint to be located at the right edge of the part. So I can drag it and drop it at the end of the arc and a coincident relation is automatically created. Let's convert these two edges into sketch geometry and doing so projects the edge onto the sketch plane and converts them into sketch entities. Let's trim up the line and add some dimensions. The arc is gonna be 10 millimeters and the vertical distance from the mounting hole will be 25. Earlier we used the extrude command to add material to create our first feature. But an easier way to do this is to simply use Instant 3D. This is as simple as dragging the handle on my sketch. I can drag in either direction or hold down the M key which allows me to extrude about the midplane. Using the ruler, I can snap this feature to 36 millimeters wide. We need to remove material to accept the shock, so we'll use the same sketch that was used to create the boss and create an extruded cut. This should also be extruded about the midplane, but only 14 millimeters wide, and that makes room for the shock. Now earlier, we added a simple hole for the mounting holes, but up here we want to add a hole for the shoulder screw, which will have a clearance hole for the shoulder and a tapped hole on the far side. For this compound hole, we'll use the advanced hole feature. Advanced hole allows me to build very complex holes in a single feature by stacking various holes in line. This can be especially useful for things like manifolds. Using our customizable favorites, we can choose an M6 shoulder screw hole. This hole has the clearance defined from the near side and an M6 tapped hole on the far side. As before, we just need to position the hole and we'll place it at the center of the arc in the loop feature. That was easy and all the dimensions are available for manufacturing. On the subject of manufacturing, these edges are going to be difficult to machine, so let's round them off using the fillet tool. This is going to be a 2 millimeter fillet and we can just window select these edges and see that all those edges are filleted. We don't want any sharp edges on our model, so we can use the chamfer tool to knock off all the edges associated with these two faces. We'll make that a one millimeter chamfer. This looks pretty good so far, but we should define the material that the part will be made of. We can access the broad material library or select from one of our favorite materials. In this case, aluminum 6061. This not only sets the appearance of the part, but also defines the mechanical properties which is useful in weight and strength calculations. We may also want to provide other information about our part. For instance, we can give it a description. We'll call this lower bracket. We'll give it a part number, 17-900, key in who created the part, and a creation date. This information is especially useful in title blocks, bills of materials, and in searches when you don't remember a part number, as you'll see later in the demonstration. Next, we need to save our part. Just hit the save button and give it a name, 17-900. At this point, we're not saving the part to some folder or network drive. We're actually securely saving it to the 3D Experience platform. This part is now available to share with anyone on my design team so they can see the progress of my design. Next, we'll make a drawing of this part. Creating drawings is simple. 
choose a drawing template, and start placing views. We'll start with a front view. Automatically project the top view and a side view. An isometric view can be created by dragging off at any angle that you choose. And when you get the isometric view that you want, you can position it on the sheet. This isometric view would look great shaded. And we don't need to see the center lines in this view, so we can delete them. Now many dimensions were used to create this part. And to leverage those dimensions here on the drawing, we can use the Insert Model Items tool to extract the model dimensions. We'll make sure to insert the whole callouts and locations and all the dimensions are placed neatly on the drawing views. Everyone likes to make tidy drawings and organizing your drawing for clarity is a breeze. Drag dimensions from one view to another, tighten up some extension lines, and move some dimensions and callouts for clarity. And this radius dimension would look better on the bottom edge. The top view, that looks pretty good. And in the right view, let's move the 2 millimeter radius dimension to this outside edge. These two dimensions identify the chamfer, but let's hide them and add a special type of dimension for chamfers. This dimension allows me to call out a chamfer in a simplified, concise manner. That looks good, and if we look at the title block, you can see that it's up to date and has extracted the material, drawn by, date, the name of the part, perfect. Now one more thing we need to do is to provide a way to connect the Moto knee to the VF2 foot. So let's go back to the part. The previous design of the lower bracket had the proper features for this connection. So as opposed to recreating these features from scratch, let's leverage those features for this new part. Now I don't remember the number of the old part or where it resided, but I do know it was called lower bracket and it was saved to the 3D Experience platform. So we'll use the powerful search capabilities to look for the old part in the secure cloud storage. This search returns several results that have lower bracket in their description, and we can recognize the old part from the thumbnail. Let's open the old part in its own window and take a look. To hold the VF2 foot, the old lower bracket had a mounting hole, another hole for clearance, and a saw cut to clamp down on the tube in the foot assembly. Now, we could interrogate those features, extract the dimensional information, and recreate them in the new part, but it would be easier to just reuse these features. Let's organize our windows and select the three features from the old part and simply drag and drop them to the new part. On placement, we're prompted to choose what to do with the external relations that previously located these features. We'll choose to dangle and we'll repair these relations. We're done with the old part, so let's close it down and get to work on locating the features in the new part. If we look at the sketch for the hole, we can see the dangling relation is indicated by the color of the sketch vertex. And we can repair this by dragging the vertex to an edge in this new part to re-establish a midpoint relation. Let's exit the sketch and we can see that everything looks great with our new lower bracket. Let's go back to our drawing and make sure that everything is up to date. As you can see, the drawing is fully associative with the part, and all the changes are reflected in all the views. Next, we'll add the center marks to this hole in the top view, and add the new center line in the front view. In order to properly call out the dimensions for these new features, we'll create a section view. Just snap the section line to the center line and drag your view away. The direction of the section cut is automatically flipped to the side that you drag the view. Let's move some views around and organize our drawing to accommodate the new section view. And just as we did earlier, we can insert the model dimensions for these new features. In the section view, we have the two hole diameter dimensions and depth. And in the top view, we have the location of the hole as well as the width of the saw cut. Since we used a midpoint to locate the hole vertically, let's create a dimension that can be used for manufacturing. Everything looks great. So let's save the drawing so we can share it with our design team. Now earlier when we saved the part to the platform, we just hit the save icon. But if we look in the task pane, we can see the drawing and part relationship. The icons indicate the drawing is new and the part has been modified since we last saved it. I can also see that the part is reserved by me, so I'm the only one who has permissions to make changes. Saving the drawing prompts for a drawing name and it assumes the same name as the part. When we save to the 3D Experience platform, we are adding both of these documents and their relationship to each other. 
The drawing and part are uploaded to the cloud and available for collaboration with others. We're done with the drawing and now we want to assemble the new lower bracket to the Moto knee assembly. Let's tile our windows and what we need to do is assemble the lower bracket between the two side plates and line up the holes. An easy way to do this is with a SmartMate. Just drag the edge of our new part and drop it on the corresponding edge of the side plate. Simple. This mates the two parts together by making the edges concentric and coincident with each other, but the part is still free to rotate about the axis of the hole. This is easy to fix. All we need to do is drag the cylindrical face of the hole onto the screw and it smart mates them together by adding a concentric mate. And now the lower bracket is fully located in the assembly. To hold the shock, we want to add an M6 shoulder screw. But how long? Just select the two faces and a quick look in the status bar gives us a quick measurement of 25 millimeters. To find a suitable shoulder screw, we'll again leverage the powerful search of the 3D Experience platform. Enter shoulder in the search bar and we are presented with 12 results of various sizes and lengths. To narrow our search, we'll add M6 and 25 to our search term. This reveals two shoulder screws that meet the criteria, one standard and one low profile. Let's use the standard head size and add it to our assembly with a drag and drop. This screw is assembled but not positioned. Dragging the edge of the shoulder and dropping it on the edge of the tapped hole will smart mate it into position. The shock needs to be assembled to the shoulder screw and this can be done with a smart mate as well, capturing a concentric mating relationship. That looks really good, but we should provide access to the shoulder screw. Let's change the size of the hole in the side plate from 8 to 16 millimeters and that will provide easy access to the shoulder screw for maintenance. We've completed the lower bracket design and assembly. Now let's move on and investigate how the Moto knee works. The upper pivot mount rotates and drives the follower through the cam plates on the side, which is resisted by the shock. Everything works great, but there are alternate assembly options to change the flex and resistance range by using the outer or the inner hole for the upper shoulder screw. We can easily relocate the screw by editing its mates. Let's unselect the outer hole and select the inner hole instead. All the components assembled to the screw are repositioned to the new location as well. The motion of the linkage is maintained and appears to work well. But as with any assembly, with motion or not, we should perform an interference detection to verify that there are no clashes. The interference calculation returns two results. We can highlight the interferences on the screen and we'll change the display of the non-interfering parts to better visualize the clashes. Each interference can be interrogated and each defending part can be highlighted. We have some work to do, so let's cut a section view and investigate further. We can clearly see that there are interferences between several parts as we learn from the interference detection. Another great tool that's useful for assemblies with motion is to perform a real-time collision detection. We can choose the entire assembly or choose the offending components and drag the assembly through its range of motion. When a collision is detected, the motion is stopped. Collision detection is a very useful tool for those hard to spot interferences with moving components. In order to alleviate this clash, let's change the pocket in the upper pivot mount part and increase the angle from 5 to 12 degrees. That should solve the interference and we can verify our assembly moves through its full range of motion. Now we've made a change to this part here, so we should change its related drawing as well. The name of the part is 17-840. And again, we'll use the search tool to find its drawing. Key in 840, and we are presented with several items, including the drawing we want to update. Let's open it, and notice the drawing will be automatically updated with the dimension change that we just made. No further changes need to be made to this drawing, but we do need to save it to share our changes with the design team. The icons indicate that the drawing and part have been modified, but upon further investigation, we can see that these two documents are in a released state. Changes are not permitted to parts in release state, but we can create a new revision. Upon save, we have the option to bump the revision of the part, and we can create a revision comment. Changed pocket angle. That's it. We've modified the part and drawing and given it a new revision number. 
These new revisions are stored in the 3D Experience platform, and we now have a history of the changes that were made. The task pane indicates that the revision we're working with is B.1. That was easy. Now let's go back to the assembly. We've completed the task we set out to do, but we need to document the changes to the assembly. A great way to do this is with an exploded view. Animating the explode steps is a great way to visualize the assembly process and see how an assembly comes apart or goes together, and these animations can be saved as video files that can be used on the shop floor. Let's edit the explode view and capture how the newly added parts will be exploded. Just drag the shoulder screw out and the lower bracket downward, and that looks good. Explode lines are useful to help communicate complicated explode steps. So let's route a line from the screw through the hole in the lower bracket to the shock. The explode line for the mounting screw should include the lower bracket, and that can be easily accomplished by adding a jog. We'll add a concentric relation between the jog and the front hole, and we're done. Let's collapse the assembly and work on updating the assembly drawing. The name of this assembly is Modoni, so again, we'll do a search to find its drawing. We've quickly found the Modoni drawing, so let's open it up. Again, the drawing will be automatically updated when opened, and we can watch the change of the new lower bracket and shoulder screw, and we can even see their explode locations and explode lines. We have two balloons that are dangling because they pointed to the old lower bracket and pin that we initially deleted, but we can reattach these balloons to the new parts. Simply drag and drop the arrow onto the new parts, and the balloon numbers for these new parts are automatically captured. 28 and 29 are the new balloon numbers, and we can check the bill of materials to verify that those are the corresponding item numbers. Sheet 2 of this drawing contains some orthographic views for overall dimensions of the Modoni, and we can see that the upper pin is in the inner position, and the new bracket and shoulder screw are properly represented. The Modoni drawing has been updated and ready to share. All we need to do is save it. This drawing and its related components are also in a release state, and as we did earlier, we need to bump the revision of these documents. The drawing, the assembly, and any parts such as the side plate and its subassembly need to get new revisions. For historical tracking, we can add a revision comment to describe the changes made to the assembly drawing, and then hit save. All these documents will then be uploaded to the 3D Experience platform. We have completed the redesign of the Modoni. We created a new lower bracket and drawing, assembled it and the shoulder screw, and removed the interference in the upper pivot mount, and updated the assembly drawing. Let's close this down and move on. For the Modoni redesign, we used the community to communicate about some issues and an idea about the redesign. However, if you want to formalize that process a bit more, we can use an app like Collaborative Tasks. Collaborative Tasks allow you to create, assign, and manage tasks in drag-and-drop Kanban-style dashboards, easily setting priorities to help keep teams on track. Here we have two assigned tasks, and we can drag the first one to the in-work column. This notifies whoever created the task that it's now being worked on. Expanding the task, we can see that our manager has created a part called Link in XDesign, which is our browser-based CAD tool, and would like me to add it to the VF2 foot assembly. We're also asked to remove some material to make it lighter in weight. Tasks can contain all the information to complete the job. Reference files can be included to add context such as this PDF file. A finish date and duration can be provided, which can help a manager stay on schedule. Tasks can be assigned to individuals who are responsible for completion and we can add attachments, which is really handy because it allows us to include work documents that will be required to complete the task. The first part of this task is to assemble the link into the foot assembly. Let's get started by opening the VF2 foot directly from the task. Remember, the task mentioned that the link was created with XDesign, but that's not a problem. We can open that part directly in SOLIDWORKS and use it for our assembly. Let's tile our windows, and as we saw earlier, we can smart mate it into position by dragging the edge of the link and dropping it on the edge of the tapped hole. Hitting the tab key will flip its orientation, and the mate is added. Dragging the cylindrical face in the link to the lower tapped hole adds a concentric mate, and our link is assembled. 
As we rotate around, we can see that we need a link on the other side of the foot. To do this, we'll use the mirror component command. Just select the link in the right plane and the part is mirrored to the inside of the foot and we can be assured that they will always be located symmetrically. I think we've seen enough mating in this demonstration, so we'll just show the hidden bearings and hardware parts. It's always good to show the motion of the assembly so we can allow the shock assembly to be flexible. This allows us to move the ankle back and forth and validate the range of motion. That looks pretty good. Using a standard window shortcut, Control S, we can save our assembly to the 3D Experience platform. If you notice in the save dialog, we see some stop signs indicating that these parts are not reserved and we don't have right access to some of the components. However, this can be remedied by selecting the option to reserve modified data. If no one else has them reserved, we will be granted permission to save them. This is important. If you've ever worked collaboratively, there's a good chance that you've come across a situation where you've actually overwritten someone else's work or someone has overwritten yours, and this concept of reserving data stops that from happening. The VF2 foot assembly with the new X-Design link has been saved to the platform. Let's check our task. We can see that we are also asked to remove some material to make the link lighter in weight. When we go back to the 3D Experience task pane, we can see that there are SOLIDWORKS icons associated with each of the line items. This identifies the CAD tool in which the component was created. We call this CAD Master. As we scroll down to the bottom, we see that the link parts are 3D experience parts as they were created in X-Design. Let's tile our SOLIDWORKS windows to the left and show just how tightly integrated SOLIDWORKS Connected is with 3D experience in the web browser. Earlier, we opened files directly from the browser with a drag and drop from this community page on our dashboard. We also have a design tab, which contains X-Design and the same tasks that we saw in SOLIDWORKS, but these tools are running in the cloud. To demonstrate the tight integration, I can drag the link file from the SOLIDWORKS window and drop it in X-Design, and we'll open that part. Now this web page has been sitting idle while we were working in SOLIDWORKS, so let's refresh the task widget and we can see that our task is indeed in the in-work state and that it's the identical task that we had in SOLIDWORKS. Same information, including the attachments. Now before we make any modifications, we want to verify that any changes we make to this link part will not impact other projects. Dragging the link into the Relations widget reveals this where used information. We can see that the link is a child of the VF2 foot, which makes sense because we just added it to the foot assembly and saved it and there are no other parents or assemblies that will be affected, so we can be confident moving on with our changes. Now, if you're presenting to someone that's seen a demo of X-Design, you may want to fast forward through the changes and go straight to activating the chamfer, and that's going to unsuppress its parent features. Then you can just save the link and move on. However, if you're demonstrating to someone that hasn't seen X-Design, I recommend just introducing them to the user interface first, then going through the design changes to lighten the link. X-Design runs in the cloud, but is similar to other CAD tools that you may have seen or used in the past. We have a history-based design manager, and an action bar at the bottom, which is very similar to the command manager in SOLIDWORKS. This action bar is organized with tabs containing sets of tools for adding features, surfaces, assembly, and sketching. Notice that the icons look very similar to the SOLIDWORKS icons. The only difference is that these are at the bottom rather than at the top. There are many similarities, but there are some technologies built into X-Design that aren't available in SOLIDWORKS, and we'll show some of those as we go. Just like in SOLIDWORKS, when a face is selected, a context-sensitive toolbar pops up with common commands for the selection. In this case, we can create a sketch on this face, and the view is rotated normal to the sketch plane. Selecting an edge presents us with the Convert tool, which will copy that edge geometry to our sketch, and we can reposition the endpoints to our liking. In SOLIDWORKS, hitting the S key brings up a shortcut toolbar, and here in X-Design, you have the same. We can draw a line from the endpoint of the arc, and as we drag to the right, notice that we're creating relations. H means we are creating a horizontal line, V means vertical, and we can make this vertical line a construction line. As we select all the sketch geometry, notice that the mirror command is available in the context menu, which is very handy. Using the S key, we can grab the dimension tool and create a dimension between the line and the edge of the part. And we'll make this 14 millimeters, and we'll use this sketch to cut material away from the part. 
On the Features tab of the Action Bar, we have our standard types of features that you've seen in other CAD tools. But have you ever chosen a feature only to realize that you picked the wrong one? This isn't a problem in XDesign. I chose the Sweep feature, but notice that I can use this feature to add material, create a cut, create a surface, or a thin-walled feature. I can also change the feature type from a sweep to a revolve to an extrude. This capability is what we call super features and is unique to X-Design. And it doesn't only apply to feature creation, but for existing features as well. In this case, we'll choose to create an extrude and cut with a surface through all in both directions, and we'll flip the side to cut. Let's add some fillets. Click an edge, click the fillet tool, and similar to SOLIDWORKS, a selection helper is available to help collect similar edges that I may want to include in the selection. 10 millimeters is perfect, and we'll accept that. Let's create a chamfer on this edge, and notice in the preview that the chamfer will be propagated to all tangent edges, so we don't have to pick them individually. Let's grab the edge on the other side, and the chamfer is created exactly as we want it. I think this will sufficiently lighten the link, so using Control S, we'll save the part and go back to our collaborative task widget. We've assembled the link to the VF2 assembly and modified the part to make it lighter. I say we're done. Hit the check mark and that'll move the task to the completed column and notify our manager. Going back to the to do column, we have another task to complete. Let's move this task to the in work column and open it. This task says we should use X-Shape to create a cover for the VF2 foot that is lightweight, attractive, and functional. Just like our first task, this one has similar items, like assignees and attachments. But notice, we still have the VF2 foot assembly in our Relations widget from our Where You Search earlier. Let's drag and drop that into X-Design and choose to open it. Remember, this is a SOLIDWORKS assembly, and earlier we added the link to the assembly in SOLIDWORKS. Then we modified the link in X-Design. And now we can see that our changes to the link appear correctly here when the SOLIDWORKS assembly is opened in X-Design. Notice in the Design Manager, the components that were created in SOLIDWORKS have an icon on them indicating what tool they were created in. The bottom two are X-Design parts, so they have no icon. To create a cover for the foot, let's create a new part. From the Assembly tab in the Action Bar, We'll choose the Insert New Component tool, and that'll place a new part in our assembly at the bottom of the tree. Let's rename this part, and we'll call it Cover. Then we'll activate this part so we can work on it. When a part is activated, the assembly goes transparent, allowing us to focus on the part that we're working on, but still giving us the ability to see and reference the assembly. To create this lightweight, attractive, and functional cover, we could use the surfacing tools or various features based off of sketches to define the shape. But a more efficient way to create an organic shape is to use our subdivision modeling tool called X-Shape. To access X-Shape, we can simply hit the X key on the keyboard. This allows me to switch between different cloud-based apps without having to close one and open the model in another. It just switches the tools that are available and we're still working on the same model. In X-Shape, we have a subdivision tab on the action bar which provides a robust set of tools for doing subdivision modeling. With SubD modeling, you start with primitives rather than sketches and planes. We have a variety of primitives to choose from, and we'll choose to start with a box shape and position it in the central area of the model. We're going to start simple, so let's reduce the number of subdivisions on these sides to one, and using the drag handles, we can resize our part a bit or change its scale. Think of the concept of sub modeling as pushing and pulling on virtual clay. To start with, we want our part to be symmetric, so we can choose the center plane to define symmetry. Now, we want our part to have an organic shape, but we also need to have some hard edges on the bottom and side. We can simply select those edges and use the crease tool to extend those faces and give us a hard edge. To position the bottom edge of our cover, we can window select these items and we're presented with a triad which we call the robot. The orientation of the robot is determined by the average of the normals of the selected items, but we can easily change this to a global XYZ orientation and we can move the selection in those cardinal directions. Let's drag the arrow to move the selection in the vertical direction to be flush with the top of the sole. 
Let's select some of the vertices on the right and we'll drag those out a bit to provide some more coverage for the shock. Selecting the vertices on the top, we can use the robot and rotate down a bit to change the angle of the selection. But to add more interest to our cover, we can use the Align Entities by Sketch tool. Simply draw a freeform sketch and XDesign will align the selected points to it. This creates a much more organic shape in a single command. Let's jump to a top view and while symmetry is still on, we'll grab these side vertices and push them inward to narrow the cover a bit. Now this is where the creativity comes in, so let's turn off symmetry and begin to sculpt the design. This is as easy as just pushing and pulling on various areas of the cover to create a more organic looking cover that is functional but matches the aesthetics of the sole plate. Think about how long it would take to make these types of changes using traditional surfacing techniques. Now that looks pretty good, so let's save the model and to better focus on the cover itself, let's open it in its own window. To complete the task of creating a lightweight, attractive and functional cover, we need to remove some material to achieve that lightweight goal. To do this, we'll select the face and use the shell command to create a thin walled part, but we want to remove some of the faces. Tangent propagation takes care of selecting the faces that are tangent to the selected face and we have the option of adding the shell thickness of one millimeter to the inside or outside of the remaining faces. A preview in the graphics area displays what the result will look like and we can accept that. Ideally this cover will be manufactured as an injection mold apart, so it's always a good idea to verify its manufacturability by doing a draft analysis. Choose a plane for the pole direction and the draft angle and orientation and the draft analysis provides colorful feedback indicating that we have positive, negative and areas that need draft. So let's edit the sub D feature and use the same push and pull techniques. Pulling the edge provides real time feedback of the areas that do not meet our draft criteria of one degree. The front also needs a bit of work so we'll continue to manipulate the model to achieve our goal of all positive draft for all the surfaces of the model. We are done with the draft analysis and that looks great, so let's save these changes and go back to our collaborative tasks. Now before marking it complete, we want to continue the communication and attach our new cover design as a deliverable so anyone reviewing this task can see the amazing design work that we've completed, and well within the duration that was specified. Let's save our task and mark it complete. All of our tasks are now complete and our manager has been notified but we should communicate our work to the rest of the community. So let's take the VF2 foot and drag it to the Communities tab and just drop it into 3D Play, the same viewing app that we started the demonstration with. Now 3D Play is not just a viewer, it's a powerful communication app in itself. It's easy to hide and show components or use the Explode tool to interrogate the assembly and unlike the exploded view we made for the Moto Knee, there was no explode created for the VF2 foot. It's all being done here in 3D Play. Section views are available to see inside of the assembly and verify that we have clearance between the shock and the new cover. Markup tools are useful to add annotations to the model. So let's circle the work that we completed, the new cover and the addition of the link and its changes and we can also add a note to communicate to the team that we are finished and ready for review. As opposed to creating a new post in the community, let's capture this as a screenshot and add it as a reply to the earlier post regarding the VF2 foot. These posts are threaded and we can add a comment to this post to ask for feedback on the work that we've completed and we'll attach our screenshot of the marked up VF2 foot and publish it. We should probably communicate the work we did on the Moto Knee assembly. So let's drag the B1 revision of the Moto Knee into the 3D Play widget. We'll rotate it around to focus on the new lower bracket and we'll highlight that with a circle. And we'll capture another screenshot. Let's add a reply to the Moto Knee post about the completion of the redesign and add the new screenshot and publish this reply to the community. I say we're done. Let's go back to the presentation and summarize what you've just seen.